Is there a is there a is there a sense on how that relationship changes over time? Is it can be can it be closer? Can it be more distant depending on where the two countries are, or is it is it principally a very strong friendship that maybe requires Australia to think more about how it puts its part of the bargain in terms of in terms of the relationship? Uh, it's a question of identifying interest. The strength of the relationship does not depend upon any two people. Mm -hmm. It depends upon a recognition that there are interests in common. And we need to work out where our interests are the same as those of the United States and where they differ from the United States. And in one they'll help us, in the other it's their interests that will prevail, even though uh, they might be contrary to um, Australia's interest. Mm. There was one, one thing that we were very concerned about. President Carter in his earlier time was talking of having a zone of peace and neutrality in the Indian Ocean, which obviously affected Western Australia. And we were very concerned that he might be negotiating a treaty with the Soviet Union uh, that would make it impossible for him to respond to uh, anything if Australia got into difficulty uh, under ANZUS. And so we wanted whatever slim rights we have under ANZUS protected. Now, you've um, been in a position, obviously, uh, on the way up through power when you could exercise it. Uh, you've had some uh, relationships which uh, didn't go so well. I'm going to jump a bit, we'll go back to the, the end of your term, but I'm going to jump a bit to the, to, the, to the contemporary relationship with the Liberal Party, which has been fractured. Now, the observation I make is that the Liberal Party doesn't seem to do too well with its uh, former Prime Ministers. Um, <coughs> Gordon, McMahon, Fraser, obviously, and now John Howard. I mean, there's, a, there's a, still a protective, uh, a protective uh, embrace of John Howard, but there'll come a time if they, if they do go down in the next election where things like work choices might be properly disowned. I'm just, this is an observation, not a hard analysis or comment. What is it about the Liberal Party that it doesn't celebrate its, um, its past or doesn't celebrate its leaders? The Labor Party, by contrast, I note its two greatest electoral failures are its two biggest heroes, Goff, obviously, and Paul Keating. I wish I knew how the Labor Party does it. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful thing to turn, to turn Goff into a great mythological hero. And they've done it very successfully. Um, well, Menzies retired at the very top, in his own time, not beaten in the electorate, not chucked out by his own party, and he retired. Um, Harold Holt would never have said a word against anything that Menzies did. He would have proclaimed it with pride. Um, within his first few days, John Gorton had a dig at the Menzies period. He was gardening at, in, in Canberra, I think in his own garden, in, in working boots and shorts and whatever. Um, and I, I think he was standing on top of a heap of dirt, or well, somebody might have said it was a heap of, heap of dung. But, um, which he was spreading to grow better flowers. Fine. Uh, but he said, I'm Australian to my boot heels, mm. where it was well remembered that Ming had said, I'm British to my boot heels. Uh, so he lit, the, he lit the fuse, do you think? Or do well, you think it's institution? Uh, there, something uh, about the party itself that... McMahon went much further in disassociating himself from the men's years. Billy Snedden played the same game. In 1972, I issued a press statement <coughs> criticizing people who criticized the party's past. So we've got nothing else. Our history begins with Menzies, and we should proclaim with pride, and I believe with totally justified pride, the things that were done in his time. Uh, he governed very well for Australia um, in somewhat difficult circumstances. But um, I don't know, you know, and it was quite obvious if they had did a bit of that to Menzies, they were going to do a lot more of it to Fraser, who had lost an election, and that's always a great crime. 
no, no forgiveness there. It was a stupid time to have it, I must admit. Mm. We, will get, we will get to the, uh, to the 83 election in a second, but one of, the, um, one of the very early criticisms when I first got in the press gallery that I would hear from a lot of Liberals, and it's been stated publicly, was that the nature of your acquisition of power, coming to power via the dismissal, had somehow um, made you a bit uh, gun-shy with power when you got it, that you felt that the country had been through enough and that the, that the majority that you held in the Senate after the 75 and again after the 77 election, quite unprecedented majorities by modern uh, standards, that you weren't prepared to maybe wield power to the extent that you otherwise might have if it come there via a regular election victory. Now, John Howard has his name on that particular criticism, but it's a criticism I, I heard from a number of people uh, on the Liberal side of politics. This sense of, of, of your period in office had been an opportunity lost. Was it just a convenient? Now, this is obviously a question I expect. Um, you'll have a raging defence for war. Was it, was it a convenient uh, bit of hindsight in the early 80s, or was, it, uh, or was there something to, be, something to be said for it? Uh, I, no, I don't think there's anything to be said for it, but I wasn't surprised by it. Um, if the way we came to power affected policy, um, would I have taken on the Conservatives and the party said that we are going to oppose apartheid? There was a party meeting that said, why are we doing this and not supporting our Africana cousins? Um, and, uh, you know, there, there, there are so many examples, if you like. The human rights issues, the refugee issues. Um, land rights. Land rights post-arrival services for migrants, environmental issues, Fraser Island, um, and uh, the Kakadu National Park, arguments with Jockey Peterson over the uh, Great Barrier Reef. Um, all of these uh, were fairly hard and took a lot of time, and I think they showed the nature of the government. Mm. In the labor environment was totally different from that which emerged later. We passed laws which would have made it easier for corporations to defend themselves if there were predatory union attacks. Uh, but then, having passed the laws and industry organizations applauding us for that, they say, come on, the unions are doing this, the government's got to come in and prosecute now. I said, you've got to activate the law. We pass the laws which enable people to defend themselves, but don't expect the person who designed to establish a fair bargaining situation in the marketplace for labor, don't expect them to come in partisan, um, because if so, we would then be prosecuting business for all their breaches of award. So on economic policy, um, you'd argue you were... On, on, on economic policy, uh, I, I suppose the easy one that people lay at me, well, we should have devalued. Well, we did initiate what was called a dirty float, which nobody criticized during its period in operation. Uh, it did well for Australia. I used to love being in America and getting a dollar twenty-eight for every dollar Australian, which happened in 1981. And after the float of the dollar, it went down to 67 or 8, I think, didn't it? You didn't remember better than me, yeah, but, but it went down quite a lot. A few years ago, it got as low as 48, I think and, it was. Um, but at that time, in my time, the Treasury and the Reserve Bank were both flatly opposed to floating the dollar. Mm -hmm. And both these organizations were highly respected and if we'd been known as a government who floated the dollar against the advice of Treasury, and more importantly, against the advice of the Reserve Bank, we would have been held up for a bunch of financial fools. But now it's a sin because I didn't do it. You didn't do it. Is, is, the sense, is the sense of leaving power in 1983 with the economy deep in recession that that, that was the thing that might have coloured the, uh, the, the sort of post 83 liberal view of, uh, of, of your government? Um, well, well the, the, the way the capital market inquiry had been handled, 
um, really depicted me as trying to hold up all the changes, uh, where the fact that we should have a capital market inquiry was in the 1975 policy speech. Many changes were made because I had a lot of support from Prime Minister's Department and uh, from uh, Professor John Rose, who's one of the best economists Australia's seen, and people like Ian Castles and Ed Visborn, uh, but always against the opposition of bank and treasury. We could have moved so much faster uh, if, um, and, and I, you know, I was personally annoyed that the capital market inquiry, which in the end Hawke implemented, wasn't implemented in my time because we'd had it long enough.